you're racing, you have a six-point harness. The point of that is to keep you safe while you're in the vehicle. But in the event you need to get out, there's a seventh part of that seatbelt that is even more important, and that's the quick release. All of this is the quick release part of the seatbelt so that when that awful thing that you never wanted to happen happens, you can get out quickly and not panic. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the YouTube channel. I'm Turbo John. And I'm Kelly. What are you doing here? I'm taking over your channel for a little bit. You are? Why? I am. Why? Why? Because we're going to talk about what happens if you get in a wreck. We're not supposed to talk about that. But we have to talk about that. We have to talk about that because you have a family and you have a wife. I do. And we need to make sure all our ducks are in a row if something bad happens to you, whether you live or maybe you don't live and you wreck on the track. Yeah, it's probably something we need to talk about. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, while y'all are talking about that, I'm going to go work on a race car. I would expect nothing else. Awesome. <laughs> Love you. Love you. Parents, I know we have a lot of young Turbo John fans out there, so you may want to stop the video and preview it before you let them watch. We're not going to talk about anything graphic, but it is a tough topic, and so I think you probably want to make sure that they're okay listening to it, if they even want to watch it. They're not going to find this video to be the most exciting thing in the world. But I do want to stop for a second and tell you why I decided to do this video, because every time John gets behind that wheel, there's always this little stressor in the back of my mind. Like, what if the worst thing happens? What am I going to do? How am I going to, how am I going to be okay? How am I going to make it okay for Chase? And, um, obviously there is no way to be okay with the death of a loved one or incapacitation of a loved one, but there are things we can do to make the situation easier so that we can focus on your loved one and not have to focus on the paperwork and all of the tangle of legal things that need to be worked out. You can take care of that stuff ahead so that if the worst does happen, you can focus on the person that you love. And so that's what this video is about. It's how to get everything, everything straightened out, squared away so that you are, it's all handled and you can focus on the important things in your life. So that's why we did this video. I know that you're thinking about it. I've talked to several of you about this at different times on the track in the last several months. Um, this video is for you. So I hope that you will find it very helpful um, in squaring away your ducks. So I want to introduce you guys to um, some wonderful guests that I have here. Um, we have Katie Wall and Jenny Snyder. They are experts in this area, and they are going to talk to us a little bit about what we do need to think about to make sure that um, that we have everything in place. And before they start, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi, guys. <laughs> um, before we start, I just want to say that this is not legal advice, right? Like, um, Katie and Jenny are here. They're going to give us general advice. They're maybe going to give me some specific advice. Um, around questions that I ask, but you really do need to find somebody to meet with a professional who can give you advice, who really understands your situation and can give you specific advice. This is just sort of general for knowledge purposes, not specific advice. All right. So, um, hi, you guys. Um, Katie, do you want to start and tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Let's go ahead and get used to this very strong North Carolina accent off the bat. <laughs> So I'm a North Carolina native. I grew up in Scotland County. I am currently a financial advisor, licensed, a certified financial planner, and a certified exit planning advisor. Along with those really exciting terms, I am the wife of a hobby race car driver. Behind me are a number of trophies and McLarens built out of Legos. So we're big fans. <laughs> I love it. We have track days coming up next week. We are members at Virginia International Raceway and a number of other tracks that we go to. And I am also, unfortunately, from my first marriage, a widow. So this is a topic that is particularly pertinent that I have a lot of experience in a lot of the different pieces of it. Um, just like you said, everybody's situation is very unique, but I do want to share some experiences and just general advice that is helpful to just anyone who loves a race car driver. Yeah. Awesome. Jenny, 
Yes, I'm Jenny Snyder of Snyder Law. I do estate planning. So that's wills, trusts, kind of, you know, the end of life and incapacity. Um, I'm originally from New York City. I'll try to keep that accent under wraps. Um, <laughs> we'll forgive we can, you. We, we'll we have a little wall, we'll have York coffee. York. It'll be great. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I've been down here 11 years. So um loving North Carolina. My kids, you know, they're North Carolinians. And um, I, you know, my practice has evolved over the years to really kind of look to see where plans fail, fill those gaps and really help people create a plan. Because I think the other thing and this will come up in conversation later, but pieces of paper are a false sense of security. So even just getting the papers that will talk about what people need is just one piece of the puzzle when you are thinking about a loved one um, getting injured or passing away. Um, there's other things you need to get into place. So, so just kind of, you know, all of it is really making sure that people have a plan, looking to see where they fail and filling those gaps. So I'm really passionate about what I do. And, uh, and I'm, thank you for having me tonight so we can share some of that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just, I'm really glad you guys agreed to come on and talk about this. It's, like I said, it's something that's always in the back of my mind. Every time he takes off from that starting line, I say a little prayer for his safety. Sometimes I'll even like pat the car, <laughs> be like, please take care of him. Um, because it, it's always in the back of my mind. And so since I've kind of gone through a lot of this, um, I do feel a lot better uh, about it. It's, it's, it is a lot, but there's still things, you know, and especially having a conversation with Jenny is really enlightening you guys, because she brought up some things I hadn't even thought about that. I thought it was maybe done with the estate planning process. And then I'm like, Oh, <laughs> didn't even think about that. Um, Katie's got some great insight on, you know, life insurance for a race. Let's just dive in. But before we start, I want Jenny to give us just a real quick high level. You know, what is estate planning? Cause I think we all know the term, but it's kind of like, wait, I, I don't have an estate. You know, when am I rich? But everybody does have an estate. So, so Jenny, give us a little overview of like what did that mean? That thank you for asking that because a lot of people give me that feedback. They'll say, I don't have an estate, I don't really have that much, I don't have to plan, or they'll say, Oh my, I finally have you know this much money and now I can plan. And the truth is you are your estate, like it's you. And so you can have negative net worth and obviously things that we'll talk about, you know, to get into place for everyone. But we always need the documents so that somebody can help us out if we can't do things for ourselves, whether it's make medical decisions or financial decisions, you know, sign a legal document. So if we have, if we create a plan where someone else can assist us while we're incapacitated and can't do it ourselves, or let's say a will that would help my family um, after I pass away, that really is what estate planning is. I've got a whole bunch of pet peeves about the language that we use around this because it does make people think they don't need it. Um, so when you don't have yeah. to be a Rockefeller and you can have a negative net worth, you still need to assign somebody who could pay your bills or make your medical decisions for you. Yeah. And, and that brings me, I'm glad you said it that way, because that brings me to sort of the two scenarios that scare me to death, which is, you know, he gets in a wreck and um, I'm not there. And he has to go to the hospital and who's making those decisions, you know, um, that would be the one. And then the second one would be the worst one where, you know, he never makes it to the hospital. So let's take number one first. Like what, what is it that we need to have in place or have with us during that first serial where, you know, my husband gets hurt and he can't, he's maybe not conscious. Um, what, do, what do we do? What do we need to help us in that moment? Cause I'll tell you, I was freaking out and he was still conscious and I was still freaking out. My brain was not working. Yes. And people, you know, it's interesting you say that too, because people will, they're in their scenarios. It's always like, you're like, just like today, you're fine, you're healthy. So they're thinking about, oh, it's going to be fine. There's not going to be conflict and there's not going to be a problem. People forget that, you know, stress and a tragedy and an accident and money. I mean, they change people. So it really is just kind of making sure that, when you're thinking about, you know, what to get in place, it also kind of, how does it actually play out? So without any documents, if you did get injured, your spouse is not automatically allowed to make decisions for you in North Carolina. Every state is different, but here you have to go through the court system in order to properly get guardianship over even your own spouse. And you could be married for 50 years. Um, so both for financial and medical, it's not always the same person doing both because you need to qualify if somebody's going to give you the keys to someone's kingdom, whether there's five dollars in it or five million. If you don't have good credit, that's showing the courts that you can't take good care of your own assets. And so they won't let you do it 
home for somebody else. So sometimes it isn't even the same person because a family member wouldn't qualify. So to get out of that system and to be able to choose who you want and not have to go through a very public, you know, court uh, proceeding, um, you can create your own incapacity plan. So it's different from a will. Everyone says, you know, I have a will. I'm good. I'm much more worried about your incapacity. And with the dangerous sport, like drag racing, you, I'm worried extra. And so it's getting a power of attorney. That is somebody to be you legally and financially out in the world and the medical side. So a healthcare power of attorney, that's, that's nominating who you want to help you with medical decisions. And we also have two other documents um, I provide for clients. And also, um, as I said, we'll give a resource for the Secretary of State has a healthcare registry. And so people, just to get this minimum in place, they can actually go and do that with instructions from the Secretary of State on how to create these documents and then how to put them in the registry. So they get a wallet card with a QR code that would pull up the healthcare power of attorney. So they would know who to call in an emergency and also a living well. So that's your end of life decisions. And okay, that's so, when the agent has no more decisions to be made. Okay. So, so let me just be really clear. Cause I did not know this, even though I've gone through some of this process, I didn't know this. Um, so in the state of North Carolina, and obviously not everybody who's watching this is going to be in North Carolina, but, um, for, but it, it will give them an example of what they need to go check for their state. So in the state of North Carolina, John gets in a wreck and he's not able to advocate for himself. I don't automatically get to make decisions in the hospital without that paper. It depends on like if it's an emergency thing, they're kind of taking over and making the decisions on what has to happen in the short term because they're trying to save his life. Right. But right. if he's permanently disabled, then no, you need to actually go through the courts and be supervised. Because if you think about it, I actually like this. While it's easier to say next of kin, some states have a next of kin law. So if you're a spouse or a child, like you can kind of bypass the system. And that's really great. However, not every spouse has your best interest at heart. And also, <laughs> even more importantly, especially with a long term marriage, is that that spouse may also be losing capacity as well. So maybe it's, you know, from age um, or their own injury. And so they would don't want to double check and say, Let's just make sure and come and visit you at home and say, are you warm? Are you fed? Are you getting your meds? Is, you know, are you safe? Yeah. Or and in the case of like somebody separated, right? Like you're going through a separation. It's pretty new. So you haven't really thought to put any of those papers in place or change what you have. Yeah. Do you really want that person? Maybe you're going through a contentious, you know, trying to figure out a separation agreement. Something happens on the racetrack and then suddenly they're the ones making the decision. So that's, I hadn't even thought about that. That's so scary. Yeah. And then once, I mean, if you're fully divorced, the North Carolina will say, we're going to read these documents. Like they're, they're not around, right. That they've yeah. like these you so that if you did leave everything to a ex spouse and it was, and this will, let's say, you know, was created before your divorce, it'll be read like they predeceased you. So an ex wouldn't accidentally get it. And the same thing with your incapacity documents. Clearly they don't want an ex spouse in charge of your medical decisions. But okay, the best okay. way to like make sure that your family, I always say like, you wanna make sure your family, you're making it as easy as possible to be helped. And the best way to do that is to just put at least at a minimum, a basic plan in place. It doesn't, you know, obviously working with an attorney, my value doesn't come from the pieces of paper. The value comes from the advice and playing it out. So at a minimum, that's why I'm always giving out resources. Minimum, everybody needs a plan. 18 year olds need a plan because they're old enough that you don't automatically get to make those decisions for them or even make doctor appointments or talk to doctors. Um, yeah, and, and guys, we're gonna put all the links, anything Jenny or Katie mention um, during our conversation here, the links are gonna be down in the description of the video. So links to both of them, so you can reach out to them, links to the resources they talk about, like the Secretary of State Registry for North Carolina, all of that. We're gonna make sure that all these resources are available to you guys, so check the description um, when we're done. And then the other document that I like, it's not it's not mandatory, but I really like it is a HIPAA waiver, like a general HIPAA waiver. People forget, let's say you do get documents in place and you've got your healthcare agent. I say, okay, I want it to be my spouse, but I also have you know three adult children. They need some legal authority to take me to the doctor if he's not available and to speak to the doctors, even if they're not ultimately my medical decision maker. So, so let's go back over real quick in case people are taking notes. So we need a HIPAA waiver, 
And then what were the other two? The living well? Yes. The living well, that's your end of a, so another name for that in North Carolina is an advanced directive for a natural death. So that is really a blessing for your family to say, do not keep me artificially alive. This is when you are in a permanent vegetative state, you know, uh, or um, you, you just like hospice level, like end stage, you know, end of life, like st- end cancer, where they're like, look, we don't have any more trials, meds, surgeries. We just want to make you comfortable. Your other option is to be hooked up to machines. And so it's just a way to bless your family and say, look, if it's gotten to the point where I can't eat or breathe or, you know, drink on my own and I'm just, a, you know, I don't want to yeah. say I don't, but this is like, it's so uncomfortable. (laughs) It's so uncomfortable to talk about. Right. And yeah. Oh, I'm fun at cocktail parties. I bet. (laughs) And Katie, you said something to me earlier. I wanted you to say to our viewers. Do you remember what you said to me? I did. These are topics that around the dinner table, around Thanksgiving, around social hours, we don't talk about, we don't talk about in families. But the more we don't talk about them, the more it makes the reality of when they do happen worse. So it's really important that even though it's uncomfortable, we at least get things out in the open so we're prepared. And I think of it like this. When you're racing, you have a six-point harness. The point of that is to keep you safe while you're in the vehicle. But in the event you need to get out, there's a seventh part of that seatbelt that is even more important, and that's the quick release. All of this is the quick release part of the seatbelt so that when that awful thing that you never wanted to happen happens, you can get out quickly and not panic. I love that analogy. That makes so much sense. I do too. And, and it just reminds me, it's like preparing for worst case scenario means that you're going to be okay no matter what. And one of the things I mentioned about outside the actual estate planning pieces of paper is getting organized outside of that. So one of the things under um, resources on my website is um, a fillable PDF of what I call a key information toolkit. So I give all my clients this on paper so you can kind of create a one-stop box but you can also fill it out online and print it out as well. But what it is, is getting organized outside these pieces of paper, because we can talk all day about a, a, a power of attorney to help you financially, but do they know what you own, where it is and how to access it? Because that's the most important piece. We have over, we have over a billion dollars in unclaimed assets in North Carolina and over 70 billion nationwide. And a lot of that ends up because your family members don't even know what you own and under what name and under what title and where it is and how to access it. And well, and John, he always jokes around. There's a joke that goes around that says, you tell your friends, um, if I die, don't let my wife sell the car for what I told her it costs. Right. (laughs) Cause you know, these kinds of cars are expensive. Many are six figures or more easy. As, and I hate using this word, but I'm going to use it as a widow, as someone who's gone through the grief process, I will tell you, that in those moments, thinking rationally often goes out the window. And thinking through who to call can often be a little bit more mental energy than you have the bandwidth for. So if this is a big fear, think about why we sell things in those moments. We sell things because we need cash. Like you said, Kelly, we need cash for certain things, like to send your son to college. If that is a concern that cash will be needed urgently and the first thing that they go to is to sell something, maybe we back up and take urgency out of the equation and put a buffer of cash available so that those things that do have value and need to be appraised and those appraisal take time It's not a yard sale or a fire sale that can be done in more intentional ways to get the value, but there is cash available for those things that you want to make sure there's cash available for. That is the whole purpose of life insurance at the end of the day. So if you think about life insurance as an acronym, and I apologize for the cheesiness of this, but I believe we can all get through it. But if you think of life insurance as an acronym, LIFE, L- Liabilities, I, 
income, F, funeral expenses, and E, education. That's what things like life insurance are for, to put a cash buffer to pay for those things so that your family isn't in a bind and having to sell things at lower than their value. So just something to keep in mind, just something to consider of of why we have those things in place, because in those situations, you don't always have the time. Mm -hmm. Time is sometimes a luxury. So let money provide the time and that luxury. Yeah, I like that because, again, just the one experience that I've had with the one accident, you know, my mental state, I was not going to. I wouldn't, I can tell you, I will not be in a state to be able to handle any of that appropriately. So I love that, that idea. Um, We can talk about life insurance a little bit. Um, So the big question about this is when you do a dangerous hobby like drag racing, how do you, I think there's a couple questions there. It's like number one, okay, we had life insurance like through work or whatever. How do we check to see if, that life insurance would pay if he were um, killed on the track. And then uh, I guess then that goes on to the second question after, which is um, if it doesn't, if we're not covered, how do we get covered? Like, I don't even know. I I have over the years talked to a couple different agents, life insurance agents, and they hadn't dealt with high risk um, hobbies before. So I'm really eager to hear what you have to say, Katie, about, um, about kind of those two things. Like, how do you make sure what you, if what you have covers you and if it doesn't, what do you do next? Yeah. So I'll, I'll first start with this and we do have a whole week of track days coming up next week. So I'm going to start it with knocking on wood, (laughs) but if, if your racing spouse or loved one is like my racing loved one, they put a lot of precautions in place in their cars where they're actually most likely to get hurt is in the driveway working on their cars um, or jumping out of the back of the truck into wet grass instead of using the steps. So uh, let's be honest. When we, when we love race car people, we're talking about people who do some high risk things just in general in their everyday life. That's the reality. If, if yours is like mine. But the first thing to be aware of when we're looking for insurance is, number one, are you talking to experts? Are you talking to someone who deals in this arena? And Kelly, you just spoke to that. Mm -hmm. And you need to be aware that you have the right at all times to ask as many questions as you need to. So does this pay out in this event? When does it not pay out? What happens if they die in this way? What happens if they die in that way? Um, And because I know many a race car driver, I know that out there somewhere, somebody listening is saying, well, why don't I just lie? So let's talk about that. That's not, yeah, that's not a good idea. (laughs) It's not. And here's why. Most insurance policies have something called a contestability clause. So for the normally last about two years. And that means that if someone passes within two years or that period after they've taken out the policy, the insurance company has the opportunity to investigate to be sure there was no fraud or misrepresentation, which is legal term for lying. So just be aware Um, But work with insurance agents and work with professionals who work specifically with business owners, who work specifically with high risk hobbies, who work specifically in that arena to ask those questions and be the greatest advocate for yourself possible. Ask as many questions as possible. If you already have a life insurance out there, similar to what Jenny said with reviewing a full estate plan, you can have your life insurance fully reviewed. Um, and ask those questions, whether it's with the agent or you call the company directly and ask very direct, specific, intentional questions to fully understand when it pays out and when it may not pay out or when it pays out partially, because that's something that could happen too. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I will say it, it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to do for a couple reasons. Number one, because we are superstitious as human beings. And like you said, knock on wood here, because both our husbands are going to be racing in the next couple of weeks, you know, and, and it's, it's, I think there's this sort of like, if I talk about it, it could happen, but the truth is it can happen whether you talk about it or not. And so asking, you know, someone like one of, one of these two women about, you know, who, who can answer those questions, who understand what you're talking about, who aren't going to be afraid to talk about it with you. Um, I know when I first started talking about this, I would, I would mention it to a friend and my friends would get creeped out because I was talking about it. Um, but, but a professional who's there to help you is not going to get, they're going to be like, yes, that's a great question. Let's talk about it. So you can feel comfortable bringing it up and asking those questions. You call and you get that. I can't believe this is what you do, or you get any sort of that. Just, just choose somebody else to call. Yeah. Good idea. Insurance says, I love you. That's how I like to tell my clients. It's like, look, it's a blessing that it's a gift you give to your family just in case. And so you also want to make sure you're adequately insured. I think that I'm sure Katie sees that a lot too. Some people will have insurance through work or by themselves, and it's not enough for what their family actually would need. So it's also revisiting that as well. Yeah. And and that's another thing I experienced. So John has insurance through work because y'all know he works full time. And um, so he has what's called a group policy, which is what an employer pays for. And then it covers all of the employees. Well, they don't. And not in my corporate experience either. Like I never got the paperwork on those policies. And so when um, when I started on this journey, I requested the paperwork and it took months for me to get a copy of the paperwork on his work life insurance to make sure to see if it had exclusions for high risk activities or not. The other thing is that um, if you're at an age where you're close to retirement within a few years, um, that work provided insurance, even if it would cover the high risk activity, probably isn't going to cover you into retirement. And, um, and Katie, I know you could probably talk to, you know, the older you get, the more expensive insurance is. And, you know, when is the right time and things like that. I know you have more, more things to tell us. Yeah. So yes, as the older you get and the higher risk your life is in general, yeah, in general, life insurance is going to get more expensive. So think about group policies as a blanket, um, but they're not going to speak to your specific situation. So if you have a group policy that you're trying to really dig in on, first figure out what company is with. It's not through your human resources department. It's through an insurance company. Typically, you have an agent who comes out. That may not be the best person to ask, or it could be. It just kind of depends. But if you already work with a financial advisor or financial planner, bring that to them and say, can we really dig into this policy to understand it better? And sometimes we have some magic words, magic ways we can get through to those companies a little bit quicker. We have direct lines. So be aware of that. We we are happy to help you with that. Um, in general, life insurance is really specific to the family. So where you are in life, what additional assets you have, liquid, non-liquid, what you're specifically trying to protect Those are really important questions to ask before we just apply for policies. Maybe you're overinsured in in addition to this. Um, But really making sure that we're asking really specific questions of what specifically, what are we trying to insure? What are we trying to protect? What are we trying to protect them from? For how long do we need to protect them? Who is dependent upon the drivers, upon our loved ones? Who will be impacted by this? And go down the slippery slope of asking the domino effect of what happens then and what happens then and what happens then. You know, sometimes we say, oh, this person will take care of it. Well, think in your mind, what's the amount of money that would put your family in financial catastrophe? What amount of money would they have to spend out of pocket? And if we're talking the cost of a funeral, that's a very easy thing to cover through insurance in terms of the amount of insurance you need. And then think bigger, think 
think long term, think short term. So, so Katie, let's say that um, we need to apply for life insurance that we're 100 percent sure will cover us. Um, while we're drag racing, what is that process like? There are like a lot of questions. Like what, what is, is it? I I think, I guess I get nervous. Like I feel nervous. Like they're going to ask a million questions that I'm not going to know how to answer about. And I'm afraid if I answer it wrong, they'll deny him. Can you kind of shed some light on that for me? Yeah. So it depends on the carrier. Different insurance companies ask different things. So it's different by the carrier. If you don't feel comfortable with your agent talking through those questions, that might be the first issue. So make sure you're comfortable enough to ask those questions so that you don't have to do it alone. They can't, they can't advise you in those ways, but go ahead and share with them the situation. Go ahead and say, Hey, in in the example of my husband, my husband drives a Viper on a road course He doesn't get paid for it. He does it as a hobby. Um, And they'll ask some clarifying questions. They'll ask things like what kind of equipment he uses, what kind of protection he uses. Um, They may even ask questions as deep as how fast as he goes. And frankly, this is not an opportunity to brag. (laughs) Uh, Just asking, you know, what kind of questions do we need to be prepared for? This is what he does. Um, how can we set ourselves up for success here and stay honest and truthful um, and, and just really being comfortable asking those questions of your agent or your financial advisor or your planner, whoever you're working with. Does having more safety equipment installed in the car help with that? You know, if you have a fire suppression system, if you wear a Hans device, you know, all that type of thing, does it help at all? So these are insurance companies. Their job is to protect themselves first. And it depends on how many questions that insurance company asks. Um, You know, we can have opinions about it all day long, but it really depends on how many questions they care to ask or if they're just, oh, you do something really fast. And then they make an opinion from there um, or determination. So it really depends on the carrier, but be prepared. They may ask those kind of questions. And you can shop around carriers for which one fits the situation the best. That's not always advertised, but you can. You can shop around different carriers for who may be the best fit for your particular situation. Okay. And and is it it's just a matter of calling up? Because, like, really, I was intimidated. Like, I didn't even want to call up and say, hey, my husband does this really dangerous thing. Will you cover him? But really, it sounds like that's what you have to do is, is call up a local agent and say, hey, you know, we, we do do this dangerous hobby. We're looking for coverage. Do you have policies? You know, are you able to talk to us about it? And be aware when you call an agent that's with a specific company, they know that company really well. They don't know other carriers really well. So sometimes you may want to reach out to someone who offers multiple carriers so they can compare your options for you a little bit better. Um, just be aware those are options as well. Okay, great. That makes makes me feel a little bit a little bit better about it. Plus, I've got you now. So we've got both of you now. I love how Kelly, I love how you are like starting the conversation with the um, insurance agent or broker with my husband has a dangerous hobby. What, you know, what do you think? I mean, you could just say, Hey, I'm calling about some life insurance and wait for them to ask the question about the hobbies. But you know what, if somebody calls me and starts with the scary stuff first, I'm, I'm automatically more invested. I automatically want to hear more. Um, One, I like the challenge, but two, I love complex cases. We specialize in really complex cases. So start with the hard stuff first, because then you'll hear no quicker and you can move on and be more efficient. That's it. Like, I don't have time to go through a sales field with every insurance agent if they aren't going to, if they don't have policies that would, I I learned that the hard way. Let me just put this. (laughs) Because like he said, you can't lie. You have to be honest about it or you're going to be paying for a policy that may not really cover you. So why not just be upfront and and say it? Uh, And how can we create a buffer for your family so that they just grieve the loss of you and not the loss of a financial piece of their lives? Yeah, exactly. And um, another thing I want to make sure we mentioned is thinking about the loved ones you're leaving behind is the beneficiaries. Because I think, you know, in, in my research, that is one of the biggest mistakes people make. Well, there's, there's a lot of mistakes you can't make. 
but um, not keeping your beneficiary up to date or some people not even putting a beneficiary. Hopefully, if you have a good professional, they won't let you get away with that. But um, what, what advice do the two of you have, especially if you have blended families, if you have, you know, maybe children from a couple of different marriages, if you have like a complicated family structure, are there some things that you guys would want to mention? Um, that's a big one and one that I really like working with those families because it is very easy with traditional estate planning to accidentally disinherit your children. So it's Ooh. very common that you, even with a lawyer, I've seen this happen, that you go to the lawyer and they say, all to the spouse, you know, the, their spouse, whatever, and um, unless they're passed away and then it'll go to then my kids or her kids and my kids or his kids and my kids. And it's like, well, this is this only goes to your kids if she predeceases you. And so if she's alive, it all goes to her. And the very next day that her plan can be changed and take your. And then on top of that, it could happen just by owning things jointly with right of survivorship where it automatically goes to that spouse. And so even if your will didn't say it all goes to the spouse, if you own everything where it automatically goes or those beneficiary designations all go to that other spouse, you've disinherited your kids from that first marriage. You can't rely on, oh, they love each other. I trust them death and money change people. And so does um, the fact that the tether between the step parent and the stepchildren has passed away. And so it's, I always call it like a hot air balloon in the night, right? It's like, it goes up and one, they may not talk to each other for 20 years yeah. or they, one of them might move to another country or another town and they just lose touch or, or the spouse gets remarried or the child, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, so you do want to think that out and say, do you use life insurance for that? Or do you, you know, have a plan in place where um, you make it a little bit more robust so you don't um, disinherit children and, or you don't want them to wait for step parents to die before they get anything from you. Right. Yeah. And, and, and it's like you said, and I'll point out it's done by accident all the time. Like it may not be done on purpose. Like you may completely be able to trust that person, but time goes by. We don't want to think about this stuff. We don't think about updating it. We don't think about, you know, who it's assigned to. So you know, it's just better to take care of it now while we're thinking about it, get all the hard stuff out of the way. And then you can, you know, yeah, relax until it's time to review it. Uh, I think on a regular too, basis. Um, one other topic about life insurance, I think is so important is for young children. So not so, you know, mentioning education, but it's literally raising the children so that if something did happen to you and you have minor children and and you know, if, this, if, if you're single and you don't have another spouse in the picture or if they themselves get injured with you, because you know, we're talking about drag racing, but like you said, you're more likely to get injured in your driveway. I mean, the truth is every single time we get into a regular car, we're at risk. Every time we do anything, anything could happen anytime. And so it really is thinking about how much would be needed for these kids to be raised, because truthfully, whoever they end up with isn't supposed to pay for your child to get to the uh, 18 years old. It's really about using life insurance to do that. So... Um, that's another thing to keep in mind is how much does it cost to raise these kids until the age you expect them to get help? Is it 18 or 22 or 25, whatever it is? Yeah, it's a great point. Lots. There's so much to think about. It's it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming to have to think about it. But that's why we have you guys. That's why we have you guys to help us, you know, walk us through the scenarios. Think about the things that we don't want to think about so that we can get it all all laid out and feel much better about it afterwards, for sure. Literally take complex and complicated, wrap them up in a bow and say, sleep better tonight. Yeah, absolutely. I've also gotten feedback from married, you know, couples that are together like, oh, my wife doesn't want to think about it. My husband doesn't want to think about it. Every time I mention it, they get really upset. And it's like North Carolina, we're a separate property state. You can make your own plan without your spouse. You can't disinherit them um, completely, uh, depending on how long you've been married and you know what the situation is, but you can still have your plan. So, and I always give you the analogy, speaking of cars, if your spouse said, I want to drive with no car insurance, would you do the same just because they're doing that? And we wouldn't, we, I want to be insured. I want to sleep at night knowing I'm okay. And, and so that's the other thing to keep in mind too, is it's okay if you have a spouse or a family member or friends that don't want to think about it, give, give yourself that gift that you can be helped because again, I'm way more worried about your incapacity than I am about your death. Medical science thinks it's a win when they, when they save you from a heart attack or stroke or, or accident or burn or whatever. And they don't really care about the quality of your life afterwards. I mean, they care, but, but their job is to save you. 
Not right. worry about you're going to be drooling on yourself for 20 years. Yeah. Not worry about how you're going to have, you know, a nurse aide come, how you're going to pay for right. somebody to, you know, help you with right. your food or your transportation or. Right. And so it's not like, you know, you were blessed that, you know, when your husband was in an accident, he was able to, you know, be okay, but there's some people who aren't. And so it's really actually helping yourself by getting those documents in place and picking the people that you would want rather than leaving it up to the courts to pick based on their best guess. Cause it's not always obvious. And then if they don't feel like there's a family member that can handle it, then professionals are in charge of you. Um, and then you end up with, with some potential conflict there as well. Yeah. Actually, statistically, I love a statistic, financial planner. It's what I do. One in four of us will have a disability during our working years that keeps us out of work for more than 90 days. How long could you not be producing income before it starts to impact your family? Yeah. For incapacity also, planning, pretty, pretty short period of time. Yeah. And I've had several of those. I've had a stress heart attack when I was 34, just about to turn 35. that kept me out of work for months. Baby, of course, that's a given. But then also after I left corporate and was working for myself, you know, um, so, you know, I, I was so incapacitated. I was almost in a wheelchair. I had horrible 45 day migraines um, for three years. It was um, it was really bad. And thankfully, I had, you know, other sources of income and I had my own business. But most people are not going to be able to get through that. So, you know, this stuff is is important. And then speaking of business, this, I think this is maybe our last topic or next to last topic. But Katie, I had asked you a question and I was kind of expecting you to say, no, it doesn't matter, but it did matter when I asked you. And that was, um, if, if your racing is part of a business and it is for a lot of us, you know, for John, he started a YouTube channel to help pay for the car. Um, we've got people who actually work on race cars, but racing is a part of that, uh, marketing for their business. There's all kinds of people who, who also have a business tied up in their drag racing, how does that impact things like life insurance? So we'll start with that beginning question again. What are you trying to protect? Are you trying to protect the business income? Are you trying to protect the business structure? What are you trying to protect? And that will first determine where to go when it term when it comes to who who buys the insurance, who owns it, um, and who the beneficiary of that insurance is. Another thing that I know happens a lot is some race cars and some racing businesses are, have multiple partners as part of them. They're multiple investors and multiple people who have an interest. So what if I told you, and you're never going to believe this and, unless you already own a business and have this, but what if I told you that there is such a thing as a written agreement between two or more business owners, outlining terms of ownership transfer in the event one of the owners dies. <laughs> there it is. And it's called a buy sell agreement. I knew so, that. Yep. So this is when um, the deceased owner's estate will pay for the value, the fair value of his or her interest, or they'll be paid for the value of his or her interest. And the surviving owners will maintain control and ownership of the business, in this case, the race car. And this is actually a legal doc document written by an attorney. Typically, it's funded by insurance. It includes language about how the race car or whatever it may be, the business will be valued, how the buyout will be funded. Again, typically life insurance and under what circumstances this occurs already written out, already established. So it's no longer an issue. There's other situations where maybe it's multiple people who own the racing business, but there's a driver who drives for that business who doesn't actually have ownership. He just drives for the business. What if I told you that there is actually something in place or something out there where if a key person passes away, it provides insurance for the time period it takes to replace that key person because now the income has dropped from the business. And it's called key person insurance. This is a perfect example. It's very hard to find really talented race car drivers who fit the bill for certain teams. So that's what that's there for. Um, this is used in all kinds of different businesses, but depending on the structure of your business, depending on what you're kind, trying to protect, or depending on what's at stake, 
that all determines who owns it, what kind of insurance you need, who pays the premiums, the tax implications, et cetera. And what's really great is that um, that actually trumps your estate plan. So the business plan, just like beneficiary designations on a life insurance or retirement account, that gets paid out directly, not through your will, not through your estate plan. Same thing here is the business documents will trump. So the will can say whatever, but the business documents are going to decide on on the, the continuity and who owns it after death. So really important to put that in place. That is really important. And so what if, because I see this happen a lot. Um, so let's say I'm, I'm, I'm a driver or I'm a race car person. I'm driving and I'm, I'm building my own car and um, maybe I don't have as much money as I would like to have, you know, to make the car go as fast as I like it to go. And so my buddy comes in and he's like, hey, I'll let me go in halves. And so he just kind of contributes parts or, or contributes money to the car. But it's not actually a business. Right. Like we don't we don't call it a business. We don't file business taxes like we we're just kind of both working on the car and we both have investment and money in the car. What what happens then? I mean, are, would would we want to go ahead and make it a business? Um, especially because if we're talking, you know, a hundred thousand dollar car, I mean that's not a small amount of inv- money invested. Yeah, um, well, it depends. Uh, you know, you might want it to be in a business to have a business entity and have you know sort of a little asset protection around that. But then you have to treat it like a business. You can't, you know, it has to have separate bank accounts, separate tax return, all that stuff. But but ultimately, you have to look at the title of that car also, because if only one person's name on it, you know, that's the ownership, that's title. So the other person who's contributing money, they want to protect their own investment in that. And so whether they reflect that on title or there's a property agreement, because even without a business, you can still have agreements about co-owned property and about what happens to it. And it's just like any other contract. So you can talk about who gets, who contributed what and who gets reimbursed for what, or what happens after the death. Does it, is it owned by that other person? What you might end up having is a spouse who gets their other half and says, oh my gosh, this, you know, killed my husband. I don't, I want to sell this car. And the other person wants to keep it. They both own it. Somebody, if they don't want to buy her out or they can't, I mean, you know, there can be a forced sale. So, so there's all sorts of things to think about before you go in and buy things together and work hours. Yeah. Cause, cause I don't think anybody wants to see it go to a like litigation kind of situation after they're gone, you know, to say, oh, you know, cause I mean, anybody can sue for anything in this world. Right. And so whether it's their name on the title or not their name on the title, it, it's a mess, right? It's a mess for the, for the loved ones you've left behind. If you don't have that conversation with your buddy and say, Hey, I know we're, we're both getting to where we're putting a lot of money into this. Let's just, let's just draw it up. And, and that way, you know, we're covered on, on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. If it matters, it's worth having the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. If it's, an, if it's enough money that you're nervous about it, about losing it, then you probably, it, you should be able to have that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. It's easier said than done. I know. I know. It's part of adulting and I, none of us want, I mean, I'd rather stay a kid. I don't know why. I want adulting. To so many things. So many things. I know it's so overwhelming. I know you're not doing this alone though. You're never That's doing why we're here. That's why you're here. Do, do yeah. not feel like you have to do it alone. Look for people who make you feel like you're on a team and you're tackling things together as a team. Absolutely. I love that. And one step at a time. I think it's really important to understand that when it feels overwhelming, if a lot of information is coming out, it's going, okay, what's just my next step? What is just, you know, what's the next document I can put into place or what's the next insurance, you know, I can get in place. So you don't have to do it all at one time you know, spread it out. Yeah. Cause it takes its mental toll for sure. An emotional toll. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. We do this for a living. So yeah, we understand. Um, the only thing I would mention to, um, you know, and this didn't come up, but, um, is, is reviewing your plan. It's not a set it and forget it. And so I build in three year reviews for my clients where every year they're getting a reminder, Hey, it's been a year. These things changed. Yeah. Did you buy a car, sell a car, buy a house, have a kid, get a divorce, whatever it is that might trigger needing to review your estate plan. But every three years, it's like, hey, come and actually talk to me. 
get a new power of attorney because banks don't like them. Where there's money, there's fraud. So you want a fresh, nice, shiny new one, um, even if you're not changing the names and really looking to see who did you name in the different roles? Does that still work for you? And, you know, and, and really reminding yourself, OK, like I got to check. Um, I've got to check these things so that my plan is still going to play out and work when I need it the most. I agree with that. I would add a hundred percent. One of our processes is we check beneficiaries on everything at least once a year um, on accounts, on life insurance that we hold, on annuities that we hold, um, contingent beneficiaries, tertiary beneficiaries, and then we do a reminder of your banks as well because that's what we're most likely to forget. Um, so absolutely, this is not a sit it and forget it. It's done. Make sure that there's someone helping you to review them annually yeah. or on a consistent basis. Very important. And I will say, you know, because we're kind of winding down here. Um I went through, like I said, I've gone through this process over the last year and it, and it took me a while. Um, I've learned a lot during the process, but since we got everything kind of taken care of, when I go to the track, I don't have that level of anxiety that I used to have. It's like, there's sort of two levels of anxiety where one, you're worried about your loved one, but then there's also that you're worried about what's going to happen to you and your kids or, or your family, if that happens, it's almost like there's two, for me anyway, there was like kind of two levels of anxiety. Well, now the one is is pretty much taken care of. You know, I know that, that I know what his wishes are. I know what he wants done with things. I know what I need to have done with things and it's all written out. And so if the worst does happen, I am free to focus on him to help him heal, help him get better, or to to grieve if that's what I have to do. I'm free to be that human human being and feel the feels. Um, I I'm not gonna have a huge mess to take care of at the same time. I'm trying to cope with the the horrible emotional toll of everything. And so even going to the track now, I feel lighter. I feel better, even if I'm not focus on it when he goes down to that starting line and I'm like pack my car going to take care of him you know it's with a little bit more of a I don't even know how to explain it just a, a relief of a of a because I know he's got all the safety gear I know that he's he's probably going to be fine and it just it just makes the whole experience better for me you know as the one not racing so I don't know if I said that well it's like I said it's a weird thing to talk about and and if, if you don't have a loved one who races, you may not understand. Um, but it it has just been such a gift. And, and I've got more to do. Um, I'm going to be making appointments with Katie and Jenny both because um, I met them after I had gone through the process. And in talking with them, I realized that I've missed some things that I need to go back and talk about. So I want you guys to um, just tell everybody um, – how they can get a hold of you. And I know, Katie, you've got multiple states. So if you would even just lift off, lift off the states you're certified in, because we have viewers really all over the world. Um, that way they would know if you're somebody they could contact. If you guys would do that for us, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So I am in North Carolina. I am licensed in, I believe, nine states. I'll share the ones that I feel confident about. Indiana, Virginia, South Carolina. Florida, New York, Connecticut. That's what I got so far. Great. I'm licensed in those states. I am always happy to do a quick phone chat, just to understand your situation a little bit better. I specialize in complex situations and simplifying them. Um, I am a business owner with my husband. And well, I'm a wait, tell them tell them about your racing that uh, your sure. business. We we can't not mention that. Absolutely. So my husband just opened a business called Apex Racing Lab in Cary, North Carolina. It is a sim racing and motorsports lounge. We have 16 professional grade racing simulators um, and then a full craft cocktail bar. So it is a very cool space. It is a lot of fun. We've only been open a few months and it's already just a huge hit. It, it has a huge wow factor. We have Rusty Wallace's 1999 Winston Cup car in there, which was never on my bingo card to have that in our possession. But here we are 
Um, but obviously, I am accustomed to some different ways of life. Um, I'm very accustomed to very interesting situations. I love interesting situations. So I'm always happy to give you a couple minutes and, and just hear and see what we can do or direct you as needed. And Jenny, tell us how we can um, how we can get in touch with you. Yeah, um, the best way to get started with me is going to my website, draftyourlegacy.com. And um, you can book a 15 minute discovery call with me is always the best way. I actually have a way to get on my calendar where I waive the fee for a two hour meeting with me. Oh, wow. And starting with that 15 minute call to see if it's even a good fit. But um, and then, you know, again, once you're there, you can check out the resources tab and there's going to be some great information that people can get started. Because ultimately, when I heard even just just now when you were talking about you feel great that you have these documents in place, I'm like, do you have all the passwords, utility, insurance, banks, um, streaming, all credit cards, bank accounts, like everything organized? Because that a piece of it too. That's a big piece. People can have a will and a power of attorney, but they've got to have that piece as well. So <laughs> like yes. get that in place. And so I do offer the fillable PDF online to kind of get, get some of that information to your loved ones. Um, you, know, you can keep it in your own home when it's not needed, but let them know how to get it. Cause obviously I'm not going to give out my bank statements and my credit cards now, but okay. if somebody needed to help me, I'd want them to have that. Well, you guys have been amazing. I feel so much better after having this talk. I hope that our viewers got a lot out of it, even though, like I said, it's a difficult subject. Um, talking about it doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it does mean that you can get prepared. And so that if it does happen, you know, um, again, you can focus on on the things that matter and hopefully the the other stuff, um, the money, the the paperwork, the, the other stuff will already be in place and help you give you a structure um, to help you navigate. So thank you so much, you guys. Again, all the links will be in the description. If you want to contact Katie or Jenny, uh, their contact information is there. Resources that they provided us is there. And um, thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this was care. wonderful. Thank you for offering this opportunity, Kelly. Oh, absolutely. Yeah.